Petty case. I can remember this area from the <coughs> early 1970s. It was a very interesting area. <laughs> if you don't know it from the 1970s, I am not going to elaborate. <laughs> well, the colour red and light actually was about the gun. But it's amazing. Um, I, we don't normally get a Sunday paper, we, we pick a Sunday Times up uh, at the weekend. And it was actually, re they were actually previewing a restaurant in this area. I can't understand this. <laughs> if you go to YouTube, just as a tip, there's a new um, video on YouTube which you put Kamala Restaurants. It actually is there's something like 20 to 30 restaurants in this area now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's transformed that world. I did forget one little notice. Unfortunately, today, the Riverdon engine is not running at lunchtime. We timed lunch so that you'd be able to see it. It's had a pipe blown yesterday, apparently. So, unfortunately, no Riverdon engine if you want to. I think with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker. Can I introduce to John Brammer? And John is going to talk about his great, great, great uncle. Is that right? John, you Peter John, thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Sheffield, uh, especially to those of you that have travelled from out of town, Derbyshire and sort of places. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry it's not so clement, but hopefully you'll find the, uh, the welcome inside warm and welcoming. Uh, I'm going to speak, as my colleagues have, without any sort of microphone. If those of you at the back, if I get a bit casual towards the end, uh, and it's quite possible, uh, and you can't hear me, please raise your hand and I'll raise the volume. So by raising your hand, I'll assume you wish me to speak louder, not that you wish to be excused. <laughs> this show is built as precision to advanced manufacture. Uh, it's history. It's a show because I have come to view it as a play in three acts. The third act is modern high volume manufacture this afternoon. You will find it, I believe, impressive. It comes from AES. AES have embodied the best in product manufacture for over 30 years. I haven't visited them for a couple of years, but even two years ago I was struggling to visualize the concept of 11 axes of machining. AES have been an exemplar in placing customers' needs ahead of the sale of products. And then using the latest information, the latest technology, and the latest engineering to achieve it. I can remember 25 years ago, Chris Ray, their founder, telling me that they did not have an IT budget. Incremental improvement was sought virtually at any cost. Their continuing growth in manpower from three people in 1985 to 1,800 today. Their growth in sales from 2 million to 180 million today. And their growth in profit from, well, I'm not going to talk about it, it's too upsetting for the rest of us, I'm afraid. <laughs> their, tr their story is truly inspirational and look forward very much to their presentation. But before that, Act two. Act two is from John. We'll cover the development engineering and the extraordinary changes that have occurred, much of them in our lifetimes. There is much talk about who invented what and when, especially with basic things like lathes, their evolution from the potter's wheel and so forth, what the Egyptians did, what the Greeks did, what the Germans did. I read somewhere that precision engineering should be considered as a child of many parents, and I think that's probably true. It was a phenomenon that became slower and more assured over the years to today. This is a story, in fact, far less precise than its subject. That being said, Henry Maudsley was indeed an extraordinary man and a brilliant engineer. His legacy will be brought to us before lunch by Richard Morsley. That indeed will be Act One. As a mechanical engineer, I'm continually impressed that the way products which we now regard as basic tools, which once were an odd contraption in the corner, have now become commonplace. 
Maudley's, Maudley's application, often to the ideas of others, enabled him to establish a legacy of process and controlled repetition. That means that right now he is rightly viewed as the father of precision engineering. So what then is Joseph Brahma doing to this 200 year long saga? Why am I here? I have to reflect that much of the production engineering I encountered in my research belongs to Henry Maudsley. You may therefore find that my contribution falls short on the nuts and bolts of this story. Fear not, I fear you will find sufficient in Acts 1, 2, 3. I am like a prologue, sounding a bit like Frankie Howard now, I don't remember Frankie Howard. <laughs> the prologue. I am like the prologue, the warm-up act. I'm the scene setter for the main event that will follow me. It's widely acknowledged that a young Henry Maudsley was employed by Joseph Brahma. This was a time of great stress and strain for Brahma. He'd started a business and basically he couldn't cope with the demand of the product that he was making. It's this pressure to perform that I believe formulated the thinking and ambition of Henry Maudsley. <coughs> And why should us you'll see that they ultimately departed, some say acrimoniously, whilst many of Brahma's achievements owes much to Henry Maudsley, I believe it was Brahma who gave this young man the belief in his own ability. Some of the great engineers of the day came from Brahma's workshop. Henry Maudsley, clearly principally, Arthur Wolfe, and Joseph Clement, being three of the best known. Arthur Wolfe, I'm teaching your grandmother to suck eggs here, but Arthur Wolfe, would you know, invented the high pressure compound steam engine. According to Wikipedia, Wolfe learned to adopt and develop engineering techniques whilst working with Brahma. According to Wolfe's entry, it was Brahma who invented quality control. Now, I think I'm stretching it a bit, but it's in Wikipedia, so it must be right. <laughs> <laughs> Joseph Clement only spent a brief period with Joseph Brahma. It's enough that we can suspect to help him progress as he did to help Charles Babbage develop his difference engine. We can reasonably assume there were others who simply prospered in their field and did not become inventors or industrial icons. We can imagine that Brahma created a can-do attitude, a could-do-better attitude amongst his employees. During my presentation, I shall periodically digress from the life of Joseph Brahma to the life of one John Brahma. Not because I would wish to make any comparison with my illustrious ancestor, but because as an engineer and a hydraulic engineer to boot, I think some of the <coughs> relative events that influenced the lives of our predecessors continue today, albeit in different guises and circumstances. We already know that his walk from Sheffield to London was no mean feat, and clearly made by someone who was determined to lead. This kind of leadership is a disease, it's a condition. It's passed without intention to those around. Uh, this must have been some natural ability that he bore, because in the late 1700s there were no management consultants or management textbooks. Brahma's influence on Maudsley is important to this story. For a few years, I worked in a factory run by a genius. The R's in the audience have a lot of you recognize who that is. He was a ruthless yet charismatic engineer who demanded that everything could be done better tomorrow. We must be smarter tomorrow. This man, of course, was Colin Chapman, the founder of Lotus Cars. His whole organization, from the assembly workers all the way down to the directors, was imbued with this same motivation. As a young engineer, I only spoke with him but a few times. His manner was terse and incisive. One conversation was, if you can't fix it, I'll get someone that can. <laughs> it's 
funny how you remember conversations like that. Was <laughs> <laughs> this management by fear? Well, I guess to an extent it was, but it was accepted, usually constructively, although not always, as being the way to keep the product fit for tomorrow, not just suitable for yesterday. I learned then that success and popularity don't necessarily go hand in hand. I've been involved with another company in Sheffield as a, as a partner and as an investor, and that would be Gripple. Some of you will know them also. It was founded by a resourceful and a determined man on a very clever idea which he patented, much the same as Joseph Brown. But it is not the end. Having got the patent and started the business, he demands today that 25% of the company's turnover should be derived from products less than five years old. The company has been going now for 30 years. 25% of the turnover must come from products less than five years old. That's an extraordinary demand, and it's something that he's pretty well met. It's not something that Joseph Brahma managed to meet, but in terms of having a patented product and not resting on your orange and driving it forward, they are a particularly good example. <coughs> Did such an atmosphere exist in the works of Joseph Brahma? Well, I can be pretty sure that something along the lines. He couldn't have succeeded and uh, couldn't have done what he did had there not been some kind of determination and drive and motivation behind it all. Joseph's father, father excuse me, had been a coachman working for the Earl of Wentworth. He was near Barnsley. Uh, but as Keith says, that's now Barnsley, is now part of the Sheffield city region, so we call it Sheffield. <laughs> he had acquired a lease on a farmhouse and had taken up farming. And in 1748, he and his wife Mary, Joseph and Mary, ring any bells? Had a son, Joseph. It seems he received some favoured support, which enabled him to have not a private education, but certainly a good education as was available in the area. Certainly better than the other children. Perhaps it was clear that he deserved it and would use it. Joseph Senior, like many farmers, anticipated that his son would follow them into the family business. But young Joseph apparently spent so much time with the local carpenter and the blacksmith that it became clear that he was not going to happen. It's fairly accurately recorded that he combined the skills by fashioning metal tools, which he subsequently <coughs> improved his production of the wooden furniture that he was making. He grew up with a clear ability to work in wood and metal. Allegedly, he made a violin, but I've never seen any manifestation of this. As my old aunt would have said, his hands were blessed. His younger brother, Thomas, born much later in 1769, ultimately became a blacksmith in the nearby town of Rotherham. Joseph Thomas Brahma, as he was called, was my great, great, great grandfather. <coughs> he was a blacksmith in Rotherham. It's interesting, I found that photograph, I think I needed an illustration of a blacksmith, just in case anybody didn't know what a blacksmith looked like. But actually, that picture could be from two or three hundred years ago. With the exception of the plastic bucket and the fire extinguisher, <laughs> that could be a 200-year-old blacksmith shop. Joseph Thomas, my great-great-grandfather, would have been three when Joseph left to go to London around 1772. 1772 was the year there was a banking crisis. They're still around, aren't they? The East India Company collapsed. And James Cook set off on his second voyage to discover the continent beyond New Zealand that wasn't actually there. And the Lord Chief Justice declared slavery illegal. There are so many comparisons and parallels with our current life. <coughs> Joseph went to London. That's all we're told. I'll tell this story. The gentleman in that picture is the Japanese ambassador. I was able to, attend, to, to entertain the Japanese ambassador in Sheffield when he was uh, visiting our university, and he reciprocated by inviting me to attend dinner with him at his residence in London. 
And there, together with some very high-powered Japanese industrialists, the president of Sony, the chief executive of Fujitsu Bank, some big hitters, I was introduced as Master Cutler from Sheffield. And there was some deferential bowing. He then went on to say, in 1770, the ancestor of Mr. Brown, he walked from Sheffield to London. He walked. And there was more deferential bowing. <laughs> And I realized this was managing expectations not well at all. And I said, Mr. Ambassador, you can understand that even then our trains were rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a dreadful silence while they absorbed this, this man was disrespecting his national infrastructure. <laughs> and I don't think we like that. No, and the ambassador was first to spot it. In 1770, you know our train! <laughs> So it, it, it lightened the, the mood of the evening very effectively, but it did kind of backfire that whenever I said something remotely sensible about manufacturing or the economy, you could see that there was a, oh, maybe he make a jockey. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how he got to London. We're just told that he went. Walked, apparently, I can't believe it, 150 miles with his bag of kit, I'm not sure. Maybe he used stage food, maybe, I don't know what he did, but that kind of, bit of the story fascinates me, the fact that a young man, on his own, we believe, set out to do that. We don't know how long it took him, three days, three weeks, did he work his passage, did he pay for his accommodation, did he sleep in hostels or hedgerows? All we can be sure of, that in those days it wasn't easy, it's not easy now, let's be fair, unless it was no, it was no mean feat for a 22-year-old who had no means. Neither can he have travelled light. He was, a, he was a craftsman. And even today, craftsmen, tradesmen, arrive with their bag or their box or their van of tools. He must have taken his tools with him. That's what craftsmen do. He got himself a job as a cabinet maker. As a German cabinet maker, he made the installation of water closets, or toilets as we know them today. That became his bread and butter work. It was basically an 18th century subcontract bathroom fitter. <laughs> He's the kind of guy that said he'd come on Monday and turn up on Thursday. <laughs> Nothing's changed, do we know it wasn't? He realized that the product was ripe for improvement. And probably to the dismay of his employer or his supplier, he designed, registered, patented, and started to build his own version. He had a system of flaps and valves and pipes that made the device self-cleaning or flushing and less vulnerable to the freezing, which had been the problem with previous models. He made thousands over the next two decades. Rama water closets were a big improvement, although it must have been dreadfully diseased and pungent because it would be another 80 years before Joseph Bazalgette designed and built the London sewer system. Brahma toilets are still to be found in the Palace of Westminster and Osborne House on the Isle of Wight. And although not thankfully in working order, there was a, pair, a, a Brahma toilet in the Butcher Works here in Sheffield. Not far from here, I believe, or I was told anecdotally, that it was still in use up to the end of the Second World War, <coughs> with some additions, apparently. But apparently only the company directors were entitled to use it, although why the directors should make less demands than anybody else, I can't quite understand. <laughs> this product was made, the toilets were made and fitted well into the 19th century, and early versions of the system that the system we know today started to appear. His product had a finite life. Thus, within five or six years of arriving in London, he had started his own business, successfully manufacturing and installing his patented water closet. And with his increasing commercial success and his standing within the community, by 1783 he'd got himself elected as a member of the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts. He was the forerunner of today's Royal Society. Membership of these professional bodies is not easily come by, even now. And we have to believe it was the same sort of thing then. He had no prestigious contacts, he had little resource, 
and he certainly had no academic platform from which to base his ambitions. The Royal Society had in those days a number of divisions. One was for the polite arts, wonderfully decorous. Unsurprisingly, Joseph didn't join that one. He joined the mechanical division. At some point in his membership, he was unimpressed by a presentation of a lock mechanism given by an accepted expert in the field, and he set out, somewhat spontaneously and publicly, to demonstrate its unsuitability. Locks were big business back in the 1780s. Petty thieving and theft in the city whose population was rising faster than the infrastructure could support it. <coughs> His action was to create a good deal of excitement and it raised his personal profile amongst the mechanical fraternity. The following year, in 1784, he patented his version of a secure lock and started a company to make it. We shall return to his lock and what remains and manufactured to this day, 200 years later. Over his life, he went on to register 18 patents. I guess you can't read that from there, but you all understand. It was a lot. He was a busy guy. Many were intended to improve the quality of life rather than simply make money for it. Some were bizarre, like his quill pen. What motivated, what motivated him to build that? Probably frustration with the traditional quill pens that you have to dip in the ink properly. Some are famous, like his hydraulic press, the one that you see here today, or some that still enrich our lives today. I'm thinking obviously there of the beer pump. <laughs> the little I know about patents is that they are, they are submitted and they get registered. But when you do that, not everything gets registered. <clears throat> everything, not everything comes off the drawing board that gets submitted. Not everything that gets submitted gets registered. I don't know any inventors who have had just one idea. One successful application, maybe, but a single one, no. Joseph had 18 successful applications. So, how many were unsuccessful? And I'm sure he had several ideas that never saw the light of day or the scent of commercial success. It's reported that in 1783 he married a girl, Mary Lawton, Joseph and Mary again, ring any bells. Is this relevant? Well, it is relevant because, yes, she was from Barnsley, or the Sheffield <coughs> City region, I'm sorry. So Joseph had spent years in the grime and the buzz of London, and his girlfriend, because we assume that's what she was, for six years, had stayed with him and then came down to London to marry him. <coughs> 1783, was that normal? I somehow doubt it. If this was an old friend of six years, did they write? Did she come down for weekends? Was it wonderful and romantic? I'll send for you when I'm ready. We just don't know. But the underlying thing for me is that, well, he stuck with this girl for six years, and then when he decided he was ready, he brought her to London to marry him and to raise a family. To me, this this smacks of a man who had a good deal of integrity as well as determination. In 1784, he owned a shop in Piccadilly. Even then, Piccadilly was a thoroughfare to the West. And whilst not the artery of today, it's still a significant place for a shop front. And it's very visible to travellers from the West. It was that shop window in which he exhibited the famous challenge lock. Apparently sat on a velvet cushion, it was the sole exhibit, much like a large diamond necklace or earrings that you would command that would command the shop window <coughs> of garrards in Bond Street today. Interestingly, some years later, Henry Maudsley exhibited his work, a perfectly straight, five foot long, finely and uniformly threaded brass bar. This was exhibited alone in his shop window. In Marylebone. I suspect he got the idea from Brahma's idea, putting this in a single product in his shop window. Brahma must, for an engineer, have had some marketing flair because 
practical attitude and marketing flair rarely come together. When they do, the results can be spectacular. The best known of all engineering names is probably a good example of this necessary partnership. Sir Henry Royce and Sir Charles Rolls, the name Rolls Royce remains as evocative today as it was 100 years ago. That was when the first Silver Ghost was built. <coughs> I'm an ex Rolls Royce apprentice. Ask any of us where we worked, all of us will say we worked at Royce's. That's in deference to Sir Henry Royce, who was the engineer. But ask anyone who drives them, they'll say, oh, we're going down to London in the Rolls. After Sir Charles Rolls, who brought the product to market. It's the effect of the partnership. In 1789, Rama was struggling to meet the demands of his product. And he employed a young 18-year-old from the Woolwich Arsenal, who would come to his attention by dint of some sharp-eyed colleague. This young man was to transform Brahma's lock business from a bespoke craft shop into a production unit. He had no formal apprenticeship, and he was thus not able to submit any indentured papers, but had anecdotally secured employment on the basis of his ability to file. Curiously, I believe this story. Because, to me, the difference between a blacksmith and an engineer is a fire. Something to discuss. I remember my father teaching me to file. It's a basic engineering skill. I imagine many of you can do it. Filing to an engineer is like a chef cooking an egg. Anybody can do it, but not too many people can do it well. I was delighted to see when the new Apprentice Training Centre of the AMRC, the Sheffield University Advanced Manufacturing Training Centre, opened some years ago. That one of the first jobs that the apprentices were given after the inevitable health and safety briefing was to be given a vice, a file, and a lump of bar. This rather underrated skill is one I understand. My own company used to make hydraulic cylinders. Again, it's a little link to Joseph here, isn't it? You used to make big ones, special ones. You will understand that hydraulic cylinders have to be perfectly round and smooth, and a layer of chromium ensuring the surface doesn't resist damage and corrosion. On cylinder rods that are 12 inches in diameter or larger, and the length of this room the repair thereof to a minor piece of damage is expensive and very time consuming. Repairs were often carried out, therefore, by applying stainless weld to a small damaged area. This sounds a bit extreme and unlikely. And were it not for this, the skill of filing, it would have been so. So we welded the damaged area that we stainless steel weld and then filed them and then polish them to replicate the original profile. The key to this success is the filing because polishing tends to follow the prepared surface. Unlike painting, polishing simply highlights the job if you've done it wrong. I'll tell you the story just because again I think it's relevant to the way Mark Maudsley started with Brahma because one of our fitters at my factory, we'll call him Dave because that was his name, <laughs> He was a belligerent sod, to be honest, but he proved to be very good at this particular skill. And I thought, seeing as my illustrious ancestor was reputed to have had said skill, I must have been imbued with it also. My first attempt was, of course, embarrassing, but the second, in my view, looked quite good. I was quietly quite chuffed. So seeking his approval, he examined my handiwork carefully, not bad, he ventured, as he placed the part right between his lips. And then he looked at me with an emotion approaching pity, I suppose. It was. <laughs> Shut your eyes and feel it with your fingertips, he invited. The variation in the surface was, of course, immediately apparent. 
it looked good, but it wasn't. My face must have betrayed my disappointment because the, taking the part drive from his lips, he patted my shoulder and said quietly, don't worry boss, I'll fix it. <laughs> Brahma's relationship with Maudsley was transformational for both parties. Over the eight years following the energy and the increase in activity and the employment and earnings must all have been increasing and it must have been an exciting time. I shall not expand more on that particular thing because Richard Morsley will be talking about that in the next chapter. Their passing was, it seems, abrupt. But it was perhaps anticipated because Henry Morsley started work only days after leaving France and Poland. Would they have informed a new tool dynasty? Would it have been another Rolls Royce? Might there have been another Webster and Bennett? Might there have been another Mr. Dean, Mr. Smith and Mr. Grace? Might there have been a Mr. Another Taylor and a Mr. Challen? A Mr. Spear and Mr. Jackson? A Mr. Moore and Mr. Wright? We just simply don't know. But imagine that it would have been, and had they done that, the life would have continued to this day. The name would have continued to this day. Brahma, for reasons that we don't know, decided to design and patent a quill pen. We don't know how many were made, but they certainly, they worked. I've never used one, I've met someone who has, and they say it writes very well. The problem is you can't stop writing. Once you've started writing, you must continue until the pen runs out, because the ink keeps flowing. So, weather design, slightly flawed. <laughs> He invented a machine for, pat for he patented a machine for numbering banknotes. Now, I don't know how many sources of printed money there are, but I guess not many. Not too many printing, too many people printing banknotes legally, certainly. So I guess you can't have had more than one or two customers. Was this a good commercial idea? I don't know. He maybe he made a prototype and another one, but I doubt it went further than that. In 1983, he invented a fire engine, or patented a fire engine. And the clever ability of this fire engine was to deliver a continuous flow. It was superior to the previous device, which pulsated as you primed and exhausted. So this exhausted water on both strokes. There is one in the Musée de Métier in Paris, and the one here that you see here in the Brahma exhibition, normally resides in the Barnsley Town Hall. Now, it's, I'm, it's been a source of concern to me that this um, wonderful piece of, of Brahma's history looks like a piece of architectural ironmongery, and I have always been striving to get it to look more like his hydraulic press. I always wanted it to look more like a piece of engineering equipment rather than something out of the farmyard. Uh, as you can see, I failed, but I continue <coughs> to try. I understand the problem that museums have with maintaining originality and being faithful to the original design, but equally it needs to look like the thing that something, the clever piece of engineering that it embodies. Only two years later, in 1795, he patented a patent for obtaining and applying motive power. The hydraulic press. You can see here today that that press used to print ordnance survey maps and it held up the roof of the ordnance survey factory during the war. In the 60s, uh, the Brahma Engineering Company rebuilt it and the, actually the apprentices rebuilt it. It was an apprentice training exercise and a good one. And it used to stand next to the juxtaposition with a modern laser welding machine. In time, we realised that it didn't have this, we didn't have the space for such a thing, and it was returned to the museum. And I'm delighted to say it stands there today as a representation of what Joseph Brahma achieved. Two years later, 1797, he patented a patent for retaining, clarifying, preserving, and drawing off liquors. The beer bottle. His workers must have got used to Joseph coming in on a Monday morning saying, Right, lads, I've got another idea. 
Brahma's principal legacy is his early patent, his lock. First one patented in 1784. It uses a slotted barrel with a number of sliders. The challenge lock, exhibited at the Great Exhibition of 1851, had apparently 18 sliders. But when it was opened recently for the Adam Hart Davis program, what the Victorians did for us, it revealed only 12. This was probably modified and rebuilt after the lock had been picked by Alfred Hobbs. The lock was exhibited as a challenge and anyone who could open it would receive 200 guineas, an amount today equivalent to 25,000 pounds. It's a measure of his confidence, or is it a measure of his arrogance? Nowadays, the locks are made with seven slides. Let's have a closer look at the simplicity and ingenuity of the lock. Normal locks in those days had a lever that returned to their original position regardless of being open or closed. They were just simple wards and it was easy to copy the lock. Brahma's really clever design was he returned the levers to their original position by the use of springs. In the early ones, it was one large spring. Nowadays, a number of springs are used. No amount of foraging would enable a lock pitter to find out the position of the wards or levers. And his really clever, elegant bit was to form this principle into a cylinder, which can be made very practical and fit into a normal door. The sliders slide in and out under the pressure of the key, and they always slide back and return with the aid of a spring. The entire lock could then easily be fitted as a tube into a tube-shaped cavity in a wooden door or safe. Equally, it can be miniaturized. The gearing effect of the mechanism renders little effort is needed to actually turn the key. There are two examples I've brought in today to illustrate its application, there is a ladies, uh, a ladies box and a, ben a Benjamin Tantalus. Both have small Brahma locks for you to see. They are on the table at the back with the Newcomen uh, books. There is a sign that says uh, five pounds. It doesn't apply to them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's start with the Brahma key. Keys in the 18th, 19th century were of the ward type that we just saw. Robust and yet easy to pick. It's easy to copy, and Brahma's design overcame that. The key is a simple walled tube with the necessary slots in the end, much like the castellated turrets of a castle. There are seven different depths of slots, which can be numbered one to seven. The slots are of uniform width and of <coughs> uniform spacing. However, for those of you that are now contemplating knocking one up in your garage, I would remind you that seven slots on a 360 degree circumference means that they are diametrically unopposed. So, if you put the hacksaw away, the slots are broached into the end of the barrel. The machine that does it is simply seen very much based on the one that Maudsley designed. The technique is probably largely unchanged from the ones that Maudsley devised over a hundred years ago. <clears throat> the depth of the slot is controlled by a simple cam. So the cam mechanism can be rotated to one of any of seven different positions according to which slot is required. Demonstration which I hope will be visible.
selected by simple indexing of the seven notch positions you can see in the vise. So each key is individually made, all the slots are rated in the same position, but the depth is slept differently and the combination is thus variable. With the disc raised onto the end, the strength of that disc is um, tested. Again, every key is tested <coughs> by the simple effect of putting a weight on the end of it and making sure it doesn't break. Every key is tested this way. They tried some more sophisticated versions, but that is the, um, that's the 2019 version. It seems to work well. <laughs> In fairness to the company, I'm going to show this because it does what I've said so far does make out the Brahma lock come to be, to be something of an antiquated outfit. However, they do still they still use Whitman autos to make components. And they also use CNC lathes. relatively pedestrian compared to what we're going to see from AES later, but nevertheless the volumes are very much different. The company therefore does retain an element of the old-fashioned bespoke manufacture as well as modern techniques. The key has a practical problem. Anyone that's had a brown or not will probably have to come across it. With regular loose it has to be carried around in your pocket collecting as it will bits of dust and fibre and crumbs and all manner of detritus from the pocket that it lives in. Over time this dirt collects in the barrel of the key and with each use becomes compacted. Eventually it can restrict the operation because the key will not fully engage and the lock spring therefore doesn't become fully depressed. The solution today is a small plastic cap which fits on the end. Of course, when you get a new key, you get it, but I suspect not many people retain it. But I was interested, I thought this was a little bit strange that we should be resorting to such a basic device. But when my grandchildren encouraged me to get an iPhone, I discovered that when you get an iPhone, you get one of these with it. It is actually a little tool for removing the SIM card from the, from the phone, but apparently what it's become used for, and everybody uses it, is to clean the dust out of the lightning port that collects when the phone is in your pocket and you can't engage the charger, much like Brahma's key. <coughs> it's the iPhone, the most modern contraption of our day, and it has exactly the same problem. I find it strangely reassuring. <laughs> the lock and its components are still manufactured today with drawings. These drawings that they're currently using in the factory are drawn in the 60s. Note, uh, maybe you can see them, but note the imperial measurements, it's quite reassuring. And some of the tolerances here, some of you won't be able to read it there, but some of the tolerances on the slots here, we have a, you won't be able to read it, but there's a tolerance there of two thou. It's perhaps not unreasonable with the techniques we use today, but what was the tolerance back in 1800, I wonder? I wonder if it's so far removed, or it wouldn't work as it does. The barrel has seven slots, and in the case of the two mortise, uh, so a door that you can open from inside and outside, obviously it has two barrels, one for the inside and one for the outside. Sliders are made of hardened steel, much like the banding steel we use today, and they are notched again according to the combination that's required in the lock assembly. There can be more than one slot to each slider partly to get the sweeting combination and partly to make it harder to copy or to figure out what's going on inside the lock. The locks can be located in one of seven different positions. 
and the slots and the keys engage with each other and depress them to whatever position is required. Schematically, it looks like this. And just to help you, I have brought today on the table in front of it is an actual three-dimensional representation of the principle of the drama lock. So you're very welcome to play with that and any of you that can't make it work, Tim will be happy to demonstrate it. <laughs> with seven slot positions on each slider and seven sliders to a line, the number of permutations thus becomes seven times seven times seven times seven times seven. Times seven, times seven and the mathematicians will have worked out the combination runs into millions. Only a fraction have been used today. This is a document that shows the um, sales pitch, if you like, early this century. It's the possibilities of how a lock or a set of locks or a house can be sweeted. So in other words, I hope you can see from there, the owner is up here. He can have a key that opens everything, except his wife's jewel case and his wife's <laughs> safe and his wife's writing case. <laughs> That's quite right too. And his wife, Inclement, that can't get into his dispatch box or study, but she can open everything else apart from his luggage. The son, of course, can open the cigar cabinet, study, <laughs> and the front door of the start menu, and everything else as well. Interesting, I noticed that his wife is given access to the gun room and the wine store. <laughs> Very forward thinking for 1800, though, of course. <laughs> and again, all the individual people within the household can have whatever lock suits their purpose. The gardener want for their garage, the butler want for the plate room and the wine cellar, the housekeeper want for the linen store, and so on and so forth. Now, this is quite an extreme example, but it is one that has been done, and it is theoretically possible. There is one, it's interesting to note that the, when this is carried out over the years, all the records of who these keys have been made for and where they kept are all stored by Brahmas in their vaults in London. All these registers will identify the numbers of keys and who they were for and where they were made. I find it slightly um, amusing that all that's stored in a chump safe. <laughs> <laughs> I rather think Jeremy wouldn't have wished me to show you. I thought it was. So here's an example of some actual, this is actually a set of keys. This is a document from those registers. This is actually for a palace. I'm not permitted to tell you which one, but it's for a palace. You can see at the top the master key opens obviously everything. The second one is SM1. I don't know where SM1 is, but SM1 can open all of the things in his domain or her domain. And SM2, likewise, can open all of those. And once again, these are the individual keys that will access that particular function alone. A very clever and a very still something that is done today. They have a simple device being presented with a key, a very simple little dial gauge, which will measure the depth of each of the slots. And as you go around, you can effectively from being given an unknown key, figure out what the combination, what the manufacturing number is for that particular key. <laughs> customer list, again, I'm sorry, you probably won't read that very well, but that's a customer list. I'm not quite sure from when, but it's a fascinating uh, list. There's lots of dukes and earls and marquises and viscounts. Um, so Victor Sassoon, Malcolm Campbell, Anthony de Rothschild. Uh, the Society of Middle Temple, the Society of Lincoln's Inn, and of course the British Oxygen Company. So this extraordinary mixture of people who have used Brahma locks, one for their quality, two for the fact that they can be sweeted, and perhaps three for the fact that they can't be copied. <coughs> Brahma locks, as we know, are used on the uh, mm -hmm. red boxes, but you're more likely to see them on the doors of Marks and Spencer. And we look at simply uh, just the assembly, the, the assembly of the, this is the assembly of a, a mortise deadlock.
what you call a high degree of automation. And then finally the assembly of the bolt itself. Bolt, you see, is extraordinarily strong for the size of the lock. And then finally, just to simply illustrate the action of the bolt when the key is open. It does have an extraordinarily large number of components. That's one of the problems with the lock and one of the reasons it was so expensive and one of the reasons that Maudsley was so necessary to Brahma's success. The extremes of the position of the lock, and you can see them here when it's operated. Wonderfully simple, very, very positive. It has that lovely feel of any mechanism that a lot of us, and all of us, will know. It's the, to me, it's like the, an old Lee Enfield, Lee Enfield rifle bolt that I used to. I didn't, I wasn't that old, but I, I used one. And the, the, the gearbox on my old Alfa Romeo was similarly silky. The rest of the car was rubbish, but the gearbox. <laughs> I think that's a kind of good example of why it's just the. I feel like it does embody the the action. It's a very solid. It's not firm. It's firm, but it's not stiff. And it moves easily, but it's not sloppy. It's that fine balance of a mechanism that feels right. <coughs> very simple, and it doesn't need oil to do it. In 1814, the same year that Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, <coughs> he employed a 35-year-old craftsman named Joseph Clement. Clement was born in Westmoreland and had moved around from Yorkshire to Carlisle to Glasgow and Aberdeen. This is probably some teaching my grandma that's like, okay, so you fellows will know this story, but it's new for me. He'd been a weaver, a slater, and a blacksmith. And before he'd designed and built his own lathes and become an expert in making looms for the weaving industry. Brahma doubled his wages that he'd been receiving from his previous employment. Maybe he'd learned from his lessons from the departing Mr. Morsley. It was Clement who, in 1870, became much in demand because he had a large planing machine which secured his income as a subcontractor for many years. It was Clement, who in 1823 had become very much involved in the manufacture of the early calculating machine, the difference engine for Charles Babbage. But it was Clement, who in 1828 became known for making fluted taps and dimes, something very new at the time. It was one of Clement's journeymen, a travelling engineer representative, who finally nailed this particular aspect of engineering. His name was Joseph Whitworth. Whitworth, as we know, became synonymous with taps and dies, and I have Whitworth dies in my toolbox, and his name will live forever in the Zeus tables that I'm sure many of you still have. <laughs> Joseph Brahma died in 1814, later that year. He contracted pneumonia whilst out on a job in a forest near London. Brahma, now aged 68, was out in the freezing December cold and was supervising a job uprooting tree roots. He didn't stay home and send his gang, he went himself. Now anything to do with tree roots, you will know, is neither simple nor easy. We are in truth quite a long way from precision engineering here. But we don't know how he was attempting to do this, nor do we know if he succeeded. Whether it was based on his hydraulic press or the system he painted it for extruding lead pipe, we do not know how he was attempting this job. 
But again, I'm going to deviate into my own life because there's a little bit of irony here. One of the jobs that my company had to do was called upon was to make some sledges for an American salvage company. This, I don't have a decent photograph, sadly, I'm sorry about that, but this is an article from the newspaper entitled Salvage Job. It's not clear whether the salvage is the product or the owner. <laughs> but either way, these were very, very interesting devices. We made the, we made the uh, fabrication and the cylinders which drive them. I told a colleague of mine that I was actually getting involved in the marine salvage world, and he assumed I was getting supermarket trolleys out of the canal. <laughs> <laughs> These sledges were contrived of a rigid frame and two heavy hinged doors. And here, that one here. The moving one was extended by the movement of the two rounds. A large anchor chain would be threaded through the middle, and the two, and the extension of the rounds would lock the flap. The two doors were extended, essentially two large cat flaps. So the extension of the ramp would lock the moving flap onto a chain link and pull the chain through. The static flap would then lock when the rams retracted, the moving ram flapping over the links as it did so. It was very noisy, but it was wonderfully simple. It's just like a huge hydraulic ratchet. Our customer would use 15 of these, set up like that, you see the 15 chains. The sledges would be here, and they would use it, they were using it to pull a beached ship, a large ore tanker that had run aground. You can see here the sledges being deployed on the breakwater. <coughs> the sledges would then be extended a bit at a time to slowly lift the ship out of the water onto the breakwater. Two links at a time on each sled, they had a lot of control of which chain they tension and how they pull them. Slowly up and to its side and eventually pulling it right the way over. From which point they could let go of the chains and chop it up. The reason of showing this story is it's a very simple way of salvaging something. A huge amount of tension can be exerted on something that doesn't want to move. And I've often wondered whether Joseph Brahmer had something like this in mind when he was trying to uproot his tree roots. Maybe it was something that he could be, he could have regarded as his patent number 19. Sad to say this design isn't, isn't one of mine, I can claim no credit for it, but it was just wonderfully simple. And I've always made an association that maybe he had something like that as an idea that never made it to the patent office. I'm going to return finally to this man, my former employer. In a foreword to his autobiography, the foreword written actually by Enzo Ferrari, another name that would be familiar to us. Enzo Ferrari describes Colin Chapman, but describes the autobiography actually, as the story of a determined, visionary, and hugely innovative engineer. Simply, gentlemen, I would like to attach those words to my illustrious ancestor, in that he was a determined, visionary, and hugely innovative engineer. Thank you very much.